So uh, welcome everyone to our Friday night reading series. Uh, this reading series is put on by the Vermont College of Fine Arts and the MFA in Writing and Publishing program. We're VCFA's only residential program, although we're online as you can see right now. Um, and our program focuses on multi-genre education, so our students get to study poetry fiction, nonfiction, playwriting and screenwriting, and craft criticism, and there's a strong emphasis on publishing. So um, they get to work with industry insiders, um, such as agents and editors and owners of presses and EDs of literary arts organizations, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and we're honored to have three amazing guests here this evening. Sean Prentice, who teaches in our program and, and teaches on poetry and nonfiction and and uh, thesis planning and writing, and Davila Cardinal, whose book um, Five Midnights came out last year, and she has a new book coming out, Category Five, in a couple months, I believe, Anne, is that correct? Um, and it's, if you haven't read Five Midnights, it's incredible. It's a speculative liter literature, nonfiction novel set in Puerto Rico, um, and it, it is very gripping, and you don't know exactly what's going to happen in that novel, so I really recommend it. And uh, Dr. Devutri Dar, who's joining us from Michigan, and uh, Devutri, she runs the Hummingbird Literary Salon, which will be the second portion of this evening's reading, and uh, the theme of that literary salon will be on myth. So uh, Devo 3 will be moderating that in the second half as well. So I will be reading everyone's bios in just a moment. I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit more information about tonight's readings. Um, books by Sean, Anne, and Devo 3 are available by uh, Bear Pond Books. They're our local bookstore here in Montpelier. Um, and although they're not physically open right now because of COVID-19, they are taking orders online. And Lizzie will you know, put in the chat a link where people can order um, all of our authors' books. So please do um, during or after this reading. And our next reading will be on May 1st. It will feature our faculty, a fiction faculty, Trini Dalton, who was one of the early directors of this program, Carvel Wallace, a wonderful nonfiction writer, and Yushin Lai, who edits uh, the Tacoma Literary Review in, in Washington and is a wonderful poet and writer as well. So we're so excited to have all three of those guests join us on May First, uh, that reading will also happen at 5.30 and will wrap by 7.30 or so. So I hope you guys can attend. Yeah? Good. Um, so Lizzie has just put the information for Bear Pond in the chat, so please do order all the books. They'll be listed uh, shortly. Um, in terms of this evening's reading, our readers will be reading for about 20 minutes each, and then we will go into a Q&A portion um, and the Hummingbird Literary Salon for the second half of the reading. Um, after each reader, Lizzie is just going to pause for a moment and see if there's any questions, um, you know, regarding the reading or any feedback, or if, you know, if people are clapping and stuff, you're welcome to do so during those breaks. We'll pause just for a couple minutes between each reader um, before we start our salon at the end. Uh, and the order of tonight's reading will be uh, Dr. Devotri Dar will be uh, kicking off uh, tonight, followed by Sean Prentice and Anne Cardinal. Um, and then Devotri Dar will be running the Hummingbird Literary Salon um, towards the end of our reading. So a little bit more about Devotri Dar. Dr. Devotri Dar is an author, editor, columnist, and traveler who teaches women's studies at the University of Michigan. Ann Arbor. She presented her work at universities such as Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Michigan, Rutgers, Bonn, Delhi, Oxford, and elsewhere. Her books, scholarly as well as fiction, include Postcards from Oxford, Stories of Women and Travel, that was published in London, the novel Courtesans of Kareem Street, which was published in New Delhi, and the best Asian short stories of 2018, which was published in Singapore, and she ed also edited the introduction for that book. Her other books include Education and Gender from Bloomsbury um, and others. She is the founder of the Hummingbird Bird Global Writer Circle, a transnational traveling literary initiative which fosters a love of books and ideas, cultural exchange, and global understanding through fr free themed reading. So really honored to have Dr. Devutri Dar here today and introduce the Hummingbird Literary Salon. Um, and she'll be kind of taking over the second portion of the evening and seeing that. Followed by Dr. Devutri Dar, we have our faculty member, Sean Prentice, who will be reading second. Sean Prentice is the award-winning author of Finding Abbey, a search for Edward Abbey and his hidden desert grave. 
He is also the series editor for the Bloomsbury Publishing Writer's Guide series, which, was, uh, which released his works, Environmental and Nature Writing, A Writer's Guide and Anthology. He's a co-writer of that anthology. The Science of Story, which just came out, The Brain Behind Creative Nonfiction. I highly recommend that I'm reading that right now. It's a great book. And Advanced Creative Nonfiction. Uh, he's also the co-author of that. He's also the co-editor of The Far Edges of the Fourth Genre, Explorations in Creative Nonfiction, which came out from Michigan State University Press, and the author of the recently released poetry collection, Crosscut, A Trail-Building Memoir and Poems, which came out, uh, which came out from the Mary, Mary Burrett Christiansen uh, poetry series. Sorry about that. And Sean and his family live in a small lake in northern Vermont. He's shown me pictures of that lake, which looks gorgeous. He also serves as an associate professor at Norwich University. And last but not least is our very own Anne Davila Cardinal. We're so excited to have her as well. Um, she has a wonderful bio. I'm going to just read what she has written here. She describes herself as a tattooed gringa Rican punk. Anne Davila Cardinal has worked at VCFA in its many incarnations for the last 20 years. She's currently uh, serving as director of our recruitment and although um, she wants to, her business cards to say, I'm your BCFA auntie, which is lovely. While working here, she's earned three degrees, a postgraduate certificate in picture book writing, and two, has also done po two postgrad semesters. Her young adult novel, Five Midnights, was released by Tortine in June 2019, and the sequel, Category 5, will be released in June, on June 2nd, 2020. So please do pre-order that book. Um, you can get it through Bear Pond Books. Anne lives in Morseville. Uh, she needle felts tiny reading creatures with beautiful books in their hands. I have two llamas at home. And she also cycles on the local uh, rail trail four seasons of the year. So we're so, welcome, so we're so excited to welcome Anne and Bibble 3 and Sean. And our first reader of the night will be Bibble 3 Dar. So thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Lizzie. I wanted to start by saying that one of uh, your VCFA students attended my Ann Arbor Hummingbird, and she loved it, and she told me you must sort of get in touch with VCFA and do one for us here in Vermont, which is how I heard about you guys. So I really want to, um, uh, that student was a student of Laura Houghton Thomas, who heads the residential creative writing program here at uh, U of M Ann Arbor. So that was the link, you know, so I, I, I just wanted to share that and to thank, um, you know, the people who worked as links for this. Also, um, uh, yesterday, Sean, you suggested that I kind of do talk a little bit about Hummingbird in the beginning as a way to uh, do because it doesn't feel like a hummingbird salon at all. And so doing that helps me at least have some sort of semblance of continuity with other salons that we've done in the past. So I think what I'll do is I'll um, talk to everybody a little bit about Hummingbird and then um, we'll, I'll just do a couple of lines about the theme. I won't go too much into the theme right in the beginning. Uh, I'll just go on to reading mine and we'll all do our readings and then we'll come back and I'll talk a little bit more about the theme and then we'll kind of discuss around the theme. So that way, you know, at least we can um, maintain a sense of, uh, sense of this, a little bit of a sense of this salon. So um, about Hummingbird, I don't think anybody knows. I mean, and I'm really excited to share both with the audience as well as with Sean and Anne and, and all of you, uh, how it really started. So here we were sort of teaching at our one universities and doing our scholarly publishing and all of that. And uh, here were some of us um, really, really enjoying the teaching part of it, which usually, you know, isn't seen as the most important thing in universities such as ours. The research kind of takes, you know, more of a, um, uh, uh, you, know, you know, has a show. But, um, but we were very, very passionate about teaching and what we really enjoyed about teaching was the whole sort of, uh, you know, the energy of the classroom and how vibrant it is and, and the discussions and all of that. And um, as we are having these conversations in our classrooms, I'm thinking, I want to take this outside the university and I want to take it to the community and I want to take it to communities in Michigan. I want to take it to communities across the nation in different states. I want to take it around the world. Uh, and I want us to congregate and to kind of come together around themes 
and just talk, you know, and also I'm a foodie and I bring a lot of food into my classrooms here in a way that has most of our other faculty members confounded, you know, how you people are always eating. But, and so, so having good salons have food and I get in food, we kind of, you know, sit around, we, we talk, um, venues are a range of them. So we do you know, I've partnered with um, feminist bookstores, indie bookstores, larger bookstores, universities, certainly um, from five star hotels to small little, you know, uh, eateries to um, even sort of, um, I think the most wacky one we did was absolutely outdoors, which was in Cal one of the ones in California in the lap of the Sierra Nevada up in the mountains in this little place called Gray Eagle. And I thought that would be the one with the least attendance, right? Because it's like, I mean, I hadn't heard of that place. I mean, who, who on earth is going to come to hear this Indian woman talk about something around, you know, some books? And it was so surprising. There were so many folks and, you know, and, and people brought their pictures of beer and everything else. And we kind of had a lovely time. So um, and a lot of impromptu readings by community members. So I wanted to emphasize, em emphasize that to say that Hummingbird is first and foremost about community and about community engagement. It's not a video conferencing for a fee format at all. I mean, I know that the pandemic situations brought this on us, but it, the, it, it is not this. It's what we say in Sanskrit. Nady, nady. It is not this. It is not this. So uh, you know, but uh, but it's, it's it's a community engagement format. Um, it is about these intellectual and literary and scholarly discussions. I do not believe that these only happen within universities. I think all of us have great ideas to share, and so you know, it, we kind of get together, uh, we push boundaries, and so finally, Hummingbird is about pushing those boundaries, uh, taking risks, uh, literary creative risks flying in different skies, you know, sort of um, exploring new idioms and new frameworks for our work. And so the attendees and the readers are, you know, a combination of established writers, uh, emerging writers, people who want to be writers, people who love writers, sometimes people who hate writers. <laughs> you know, so we all come together and then we talk. Uh, the, the inspiration for the writer circle comes from, as you can guess, the hummingbird which as uh, many of you probably know, it's the smallest bird, right? It's, it's, the, it's the teeniest bird. And my point was really that tiny wings are better than none at all, you know? And so uh, that we can build as a traveler myself and as an immigrant, the idea was that the writer as a hummingbird flies in search of newer skies and, uh, and new homes and, you know, and makes new homes with a, a little bit of soil, a little bit of sunlight and a little bit of sky. So it was just something that I was saying I'm doing on a small scale. I'm one person. I can't really, you know, have a Metacorp kind of vision, nor did I want that for this. I wanted very much a community uh, dispersed kind of vision for this. And if we were doing this in reality, what a lot of our audience members would get and all of our faculty members would get would be actual, actual different hummingbirds of different materials because I usually take those for salons. Uh, we can't do that today, but I have some to show you because I got some for the Vermont one before uh, a COVID struck. So um, this one is an enamel one. This was for you, Rita. So, well, here, I give it to you virtually. <laughs> And then um, these were two different ones for, from uh, uh, clay and ceramic. So there's this one and there's this one. And then I have one from uh, one that's uh, felted and then one from straw. This one is made of um, South American shell. So it's like, you know, I have all these hummingbirds all around my house and um, and it, it's just inspiring for me, the idea that you could be small, like really teeny, and still make a little bit of a difference in a small little, you know, in a small little way. So, um, so that's Hummingbird. And we've done a bunch of um, salons so far. We've, we started with New York, and then we've done salons in California, in, um, in Michigan, certainly, in Oregon, in Texas, in Wisconsin. Uh, you know, we've, we've kind of done it all around. And the idea this summer was to take it to Europe and Asia. Again, COVID, but that's going to happen next year. But it's really a global format because I am a global traveler. So that's 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 hummingbird for you. That's the cell format. Uh, and the theme for today is myth. So we'll get a little bit more into that in the discussion part of the um, of the 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 of today's uh, readings. But I did want to start by saying that 
my idea for, for the theme for this salon was to interpret the word myth quite broadly. So obviously when we think of myth, something that our mind you know, almost immediately goes to is religious myths. And that's a very important component of myth. But there's a lot of other forms of myth making. So myth is just, it just comes from the Greek mythos or word, right? And uh, there's so many kinds of myth making. It's just stories that we tell ourselves. So there's political myth making. There's, you know, there's so many things that keep us alive. We make our myths and our myths make us. And so I'm hoping that all of our readings are going to have something to do with, you know, with, with that idea of myth. And then we'll sort of, you know, talk about that as we um, uh, discuss that in the latter part of uh, today's readings. But for today, my own reading is a short story called A Flute Called Radha. Now, for those of us in the audience who might not know, Radha is a figure from um, Indian cultural uh, iconography, Hindu cultural iconography, actually. And she's the consort of the god Krishna. Uh, while we don't get some of the advantages of meeting in person, uh, an alternative set of advantages we get is that I have access to all the props in my house, so I can show you stuff. So this is Krishna. Um, uh, you know, it's it's... Um, it's this god figurine and he plays a flute, he has a peacock feather, and he's a, a very colorful and fun character. He's a god and a friend. And uh, Radha is supposed to be his consort. And what I'm doing in this short story is, um, it's a feminist rewriting of that myth. So before I get into that, just a couple of lines. The book itself is called Finding Radha, The Quest for Love. Uh, it's a Penguin Random House book that came out of New Delhi and now is you know, being available in different countries slowly, but it's also available on um, Amazon India. But um, the, all of the stories and the poetry um, and dramaturgy in this book is around the figure of Radha and different interpretations of this figure. And for my story, I wanted to do a feminist rewriting of it. Uh, now, in the original myth, I think there's already something pretty subversive happening. Uh, why I call it subversive is because unlike a lot of the other goddesses and consorts in uh, cultural e uh, iconography, she is not, Radha is not Krishna's wife. So if you see Ram, Sita, many others like that, it's, it's a wife figure, wife or wife-like figure, who is then prayed to along with the male god, and sometimes on her own. Uh, but she is not his wife. And the, the early Sanskrit texts are very clear about that. She's not his wife. Uh, in fact, she's married to a different man, and he's a younger boy, and so forth. But then this the story becomes a way to sanctify sexual desire, within you know within that larger understanding because this uh, cosmos does not recognize the sacred profane divide you know uh, sexual desire is seen as a part of uh, you know the full life and so forth and so um so there is subversion there you know there's a lot of the early texts have very explicit sexual descriptions and so forth there isn't that puritanism that comes in later but also that um uh, the story itself is pretty subversive, but what happens later on with later theological trends, and we'll go into that later again, is um, that we see respectability politics kicking in. So now we see Radha again becoming his wife, and we see you know a lot of different things that are not talked about anymore. And so in fe doing a feminist rewriting of it, I wanted to subvert this entire universe and tell the story from her perspective no longer from the male god's perspective who lives and loves and you know he has a lot of other you know women gopis you know and so forth and that's one stage of his life and then he leaves everybody to go to war and then we no longer hear what happens to radha but um here i wanted to talk about her because in iconography she is frozen as this forever youthful forever beautiful forever sexy if you will figure who's prayed to along with her god and we never wonder about how the story might sound if we tell it from her perspective. So this is a story that tells it from her perspective. So, um, so I'll, um, I don't have to read the full thing. It's not even a long story, but I can kind of cut it short too, as I start. Um, okay, so a flute called Radha. Radha draws in a deep breath and waits. Tonight the Yamuna will not speak to her. The Yamuna is the river on the banks of which they used to meet and make love. Tonight it flows silently, sulkily, without smell or touch or tears. The night has emptied out its stars and holds no forgiveness. Radha knows she must not move too much, lest the sky crumble. 
It crumbles so easily nowadays, she mutters to herself in irritation. Like the other day when some of the village boys raced through the ripening fields to shoot cardboard arrows at the sky and it split into so many shards of lightning. Later they lay noiselessly scattered everywhere, but when she bent to pick one up, it snapped forth and bit her, growing blood. Radha looks at her finger, bandaged with a grubby strip of cotton, shot with dark splotches of red. Her hand itself is hard and veiny, nothing like the soft white lilies he would often compare them to when he laid his head in her lap. And when she laughs, it is no longer the silver tinkle of anklets on moonlit marble. No, it is laughter from another time and place, a stranger's laughter that he cannot possibly love. But then he always had a way with words. Radha cocks her head from side to side, trying to remember. Some of the memories are smooth and easy, like his touch. If she closes her eyes tight enough, she can feel his fingers play expertly on her skin. She can feel the rush of blood to her fore forearm, where he rubs it deliciously. When he kisses her, her lips swell like the bee-stung champa blossoms of Brindavan. Brindavan is the city where they are. Radha, Radha, he murmurs in agony, hounded by his own demons. I'm tired of being God, he wants to whisper. Radha knows. She folds him into the night, cradling him in her arms like she did when he was a child. The moment passes. He is once again Krishna, God, skilled lover, center of the universe. He rubs the perfume of Ratschampa onto her smooth, flat belly. They love each other on the river bank to the slow music of the Yamuna. Their bodies ent uh, entwine, their souls flushed. The stars look down and smile sadly while Brindavan sleeps. I'm yours, my Krishna. Radha, Radha, she says in response. Say, I'm yours, my Radha, she wills him with her stormy eyes. But by the time he does, it is too late. Radha puts her eyes over her ears, trying to shut out the sounds of drums and chariots and victory and loss. And Radha, old woman, mad woman, laughs and cries. Lizzie, how much time do I have? I want to make sure I cut out certain sections. How much uh, time do I have? Yeah, uh, you've got another like eight minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. She arrived on the first day of Vasant, which is spring, bringing with her the bloom of roses and the lilt of the breeze. She is the most beautiful bride in all of Bursan, and they say her skin glows like moonlight. Two women of Nanda whispered enviously among themselves. But what good did her beauty do? All that her destiny had to offer was the stammering cowherd Ayan with a thick belly and thicker mind, laughed a third. The gossip went on and on relentlessly through the, through the day. But when it was evening, they wore their most pious faces to the house where the young bride Radha had come to stay with her relatives for a while. The women sat in a circle and talked about this and that till Radha came out to light the evening lamps. Her hair shimmered all the way down her waist, her silver kamarband was a rope around the curve of her waist and the mirrors on her choli glinted. Is she lighting the lamps or are the lamps lighting her? The women wondered. Come and sit with us, tell us about your wedding night, one of them called out. Everyone laughed. Radha smiled and shook her head, her doe eyes calm but cautious, and went indoors. And Yashoda's kind heart brimmed over. She got up, pulling the child Krishna by the hand and following Radha inside the house. Radha was folding bedclothes and looked up shyly at the plump, motherly woman and her young child. I'm Yashoda, wife of Nanda and the mother of this naughty son. The older woman gave her a reassuring look. Welcome, Didi, Radha said, dazzling Yashoda with her smile. I hope your husband knows how lucky he is, Yashoda murmured as she walked across to Radha to tilt her face upwards to the light of the lantern. Then, turning to Kanha, she winked at her child. So, would you want a bride as beautiful as her? The child looked at Radha, mesmerized. There, there, now your beauty has achieved the impossible, laughed Yashoda. Your face has managed to silence the reigning terror of Nanda. Radha smiled and kneeled down to look deeply into the child Kana's eyes. Do you think I'm pretty? Eyes full of wonder, Kana stretched out his hand and touched Radha's cheek. Yes, will you be my bride? The two women laughed till tears started pouring out of Yashoda's eyes. Wiping them away with the corner of her archel, she put her arms around the younger woman's shoulders. Please don't be upset. Oh, why, he's just a child, exclaimed Radha, bewildered. No, no, I mean the women of the village. Yashoda's tone was serious. 
We had all heard of your beauty and everyone was curious to see you. And you know how it is with us women. Sometimes we want to know everything. What do you want to know, asked Ratha quietly, that I was married off against my wishes to a man old enough to be my father, that he is good and kind, but I feel no love, no passion, that till the day I die, this is how God has willed my life to be? Is this what everyone wishes to know? Be quiet, Yashoda admonished. These are not the right thoughts for a young bride. Rather, as women, we must accept that which we cannot change, and we must learn to be happy with what we have, for on our happy happiness depends the happiness of our men and our children. Our household is our universe, and you must always remember that. Radha looked at Yashoda and shook her head slowly, defiantly. No, Didi, I will not learn to be happy with what I have. My household will not be my universe, for there is a much larger universe outside of my kitchen and my courtyard that I want to hold in my palms. I want to pluck stars from the skies. I want to dance with the sun. Radha, my child, Yashoda murmured soothingly, at once amused and worried. The sun and the stars, the universe and us, we all have our own parts. Don't fight the laws of nature, for the sun that snugly cocoons us from cold faraway skies can just as easily turn into a cruel fire that burns to ashes those who dare to go too close. Radha smiled, her eyes shimmering with unshed tears. One errand drop broke free and rolled down her cheek. Ghana stretched out his palms and caught the tear as it fell. Look at him, his mother said softly. I have never seen him so grave before, as if he understands all about women's woes. Radha stretched out her arms and pulled the boy close to her. Then she turned to Yashoda. Could I take him with me when I go to fill my pitchers tomorrow? Yes, by all means. At home, all he does is get in my way, laughed Yashoda. And so it came to be that for all of spring, a play playful little boy and a plaintive young woman spent their mornings by the riverbed. Why do you always have black rings around your eyes? He would ask, circling them with curious fingertips. Because I cannot sleep, Radha would answer gravely. And why not? He would demand, puffing out his chest and crossing his arms over them. When in response, Radha only smiled, he would climb on top of a wayside boulder to put his podgy arms around her. Sometimes she laid her head in his lap while he rocked her back and forth, like his mother rocked him to sleep at night. Sleep, sleep, he would whisper, agitated that she could not. Perhaps I need your flute, she said finally one day, taking his unhappy little face in her palms. At that, his eyes lit up, lifting his flute to his lips, and closing his eyes, he began to play. As the smooth, honeyed notes trilled forth, the sky rippled and the trees danced in joy. Rabbits cocked their ears, birds paused mid-flight, and tigers halted their chase to sit demurely by the little boy's side. Even the Yamuna slowed down, enchanted, and Radha for once rested her throbbing head and slept for hours. And then there's a whole uh, section on how, as he grows up, you know, as he grows up and he comes back and they spend more time. And uh, finally, when they meet again, when he's all grown up, now he's a man and she's much older. So I'll read a little bit from that section. Um, when, she, when she knows that he's come back and, and she goes again to the river, uh, it was nothing like the Yamuna of her memories. That river of her past had flowed light and clear. It had sparkled with water lilies and lotuses. Its green banks had been dotted with egrets and its flowery blossoms had held love. But this Yamuna of the present was an angry violet. It curled and frothed and hissed. This river was as alive as it was dead. For a moment her heart sank. And then, just as she was turning back, a dark shape caught the corner of her eye. It was Krishna. Oh, this Krishna looked nothing like the child Kanha, who had once held her hands years ago, yet Radha would have recognized him anywhere. He stood against a rock in the river, almost bird-like in his quiet grace, in yellow silk, a garland of wild flowers around his neck, and with a peacock feather adorning his head, his dark form glowed. Radha stared at him, spellbound. One day I too will be beautiful. One day you too will stare at me. This is something that he had said when he was uh, younger. Um, the clouds gathered again. As the rain started falling thickly, Krishna turned to smile at the beautiful woman uh, whose hair was a waterfall and whose eyelashes shone with a million silvery drops. You have come, he said softly. 
Radha nodded, unable to speak. He held out his arms. She walked into the river in a trance. He held her at arm's length and traced the outline of her face with his flute. I hear you play the flute even more beautifully now, she said. He nodded. Will you not play, for, play it for me again? Not now, he replied. You will have to wait for the rains to end. Oh, but I have to go back in autumn. Krishna smiled. Stay, he said. And then, again, there is this whole description of their love story after that, um, uh, which I'll skip. And then I'll just go to this section where she complains because there are other women in his life and he has other things to attend to, including war and the bigger masculine matters of statecraft. So she says to him, sometimes I think I'm like your flute. Your flute, a dull, lifeless object that must lie in its dark corner and ask you for nothing. Yet when you pick it up and touch it to your lips, it bursts forth in a fresh spate of music. But I'm not your flute. I'm alive. I feel. I want. I cry. Radha's large eyes spilled over. I'm yours, my Krishna, forever, she said. Radha, Radha, he murmured again. He never says I'm yours forever, warned a small voice inside her head then. So... Again, this, the fact that there's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not an equal relationship. There is love. He loves her more than he loves anybody else. Uh, but it's not, it's not equal. And then again, I skip out some pages and then um, I go to this part. And then one night, a night so black, no stars peeped out from behind the curtain of clouds. A night so cold, it froze the Yamuna into a sheet of ice. He uttered once again his old words. I must go. And Radha knew that this time he spoke of greater distances and of never coming back. What else remains of the story to tell? Only that a few days later, a chariot came from Mathura to take Krishna away. As word began to spread, a huge crowd gathered in Nanda and Yashoda's courtyard. Every heart was skipping, each eye fastened to the door where Krishna was offering his prayers. Uh, the crowd was waiting to scold, berate, cajole, somehow convinced the beloved son of Goku that he belonged here and only here with them. But when he emerged, resplendent in yellow silk, but without his flute, they looked into his hard, hard eyes and realized that he had already left them for Mathura. Um, and then, you know, she cries and then she goes away and she waits in the river to say goodbye one last time. And he goes to her and... She says, you have come. He nodded. I'm sorry, I'm having to skip out parts, right? Because I do want to get to the end of the story, which is just one more paragraph. Uh, you have come, she said. He nodded. She held out his arms. Slowly, he walked into the river. She held him at arm's length and traced the outline of his face with her finger. Where's your flute, she asked. Her question jerked him back into the present. My flute, yes. Um, I don't know. Did I drop it somewhere? She smiled sadly. The flute's time is over, she wanted to say. Instead, she asked him when he was leaving. My chariot is waiting. I have already bid farewell to everyone. She nodded, raising her face to his. I'm yours forever, my Krishna, she said again softly. And I yours, he said then. She closed her eyes. Stay, please stay. She pleaded with him at last. Words can make you emotional sometimes. Um, but there was silence suddenly afraid she opened her eyes and he was gone and she threw back her head and laughed and laughed and then the last last paragraph which brings us back to the time when she was writing the point at which the story started Radha, old woman, mad woman crouches on the banks of the Yamuna if she lays her ears against its shifting sands she can hear whispers from many years ago Shame, shame, look at her, throw her out, the adulteress. She squints and sees ghosts from yesterday. The women at the well turn away from her. The neighbor's child hurled, hurls a stone at her. Sometimes Radha is young and she cannot understand why they think her crime is greater than his, how they can hate her while still loving him. And sometimes Radha is old and she understands too much, understands that in the dark histories of humanity, the woman's crimes are always greater than the man's. Some say it is her fault because he was unattached while she belonged to another, but she knows they would have blamed her even if the roles had been reversed. Some say it is her fault because he was just a young boy and she older and wiser, but she knows it would have been the same even if she had been a young girl and he older and wiser. 
the woman's crime is always greater than the man's. That is why Krishna could forget while she was forever condemned to remembering. That is why he never returns to Vrindavan. Um, he is a man and they say men are destined for great things, so they worship him. Tomorrow they might forgive her and worship her too, but what good would such worship do? What would change? Um, suddenly Radha wants to shout louder than all of them, shame, shame, not on me, but on you. Now Radha is tired of being a woman and she wants to be a man. Cackling with laughter, she shrugs off her upper garments under the starlit skies. The following morning, they find her sprawled on the banks of the river. It's that mad woman, they whisper. Uh, embarrassed by her nakedness, one of the women hurriedly covers her up. What's this? Another woman exclaims, pointing to what looks like a broken flute in Radha's fist. Uh, they try to pry her fingers open, but the chill of death is already set in. Radha clutches the lifeless reed to her breast. Radha no longer has... Um, Black rims around her eyes, Radha sleeps. So, yeah. Thank you. I get very emotional when I read things. My own as well as other people's writing. Thank you. I see a clap. <laughs> Thank you so much, Devil Tree. Um, folks, feel free to, to show Devil Tree some love in the chat room and with the reactions or on your camera here. Um, just beautiful. And I'm going to uh, move us along and invite Sean to come off mute. And I can help you with that if you like. There you go. Now you're you're unmuted there. I was just busy chatting. Uh, so sorry for the the short delay. <laughs> no worries. No worries. All right. Take it away, Sean. All right. First, I want to say hi to all my students that I see out there. It's awesome seeing your faces or your icons or your names. To uh, at least my one former student that I can see, it's great seeing you as well, Brianne. I know uh, Bobshi and Da are out there, so it's uh, great seeing you as well. Da, just to make you jealous, this is a hill farmstead that literally got delivered to my house tonight. Uh, but mostly I want to say hi to my sister, Kristen, and uh, Bob. Uh, I've been trying to give a reading for my sister. I think I started reading for my books uh, about five years ago, and somehow she and I are never at the same place when I'm giving a reading. And uh, I even went to Pennsylvania, right, where she lives, and she was out in Colorado, and then I was supposed to be giving a reading out in Colorado in about three weeks, and then the pandemic happened. So I think this is the first time in, uh, in all my time reading that my sister is getting to uh, be a part of it. So I'm super excited. And uh, I guess I'll see you tomorrow quick. So I am reading from uh, my new book, Crosscut. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk to you about the experience because it was an unusual experience. And then I'll dive into poems and then jump right back out. And uh, this occurred about 25 years ago now. and. Uh, I was uh, a, a skier and a, a college graduate just barely, and I'd lived internationally. And, and I came back home, and I was trying to figure out what the heck to do with my life. And I re received this kind of newsletter with job openings in it. And one of the jobs was for Northwest Youth Corps, and I'm sporting their shirt today. And uh, the, uh, the job was to live and work in the woods building trails, and it also talked about working with uh, – with youth, 16 to 19 year olds, and I had no interest in that part of the job. I just wanted to live in the woods. I loved uh, solitude. I loved the uh, backcountry experience, though I had limited experience with all of it. So I applied and they, they gave me the job. And, uh, and it turned out that the job was all about trail building, but then all about really working with those youth. And without that experience, I wouldn't be a teacher today. Uh, it was probably the, the best experience of my life. But the book starts at the end, uh, so the very first poem takes place in, I think it was 2011, I was at an artist retreat in a remote cabin in Colorado. I was with my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, and uh, I was working on Finding Abby, my first book. I was busy revising it, and uh, in each day I would work on a chapter or a couple of chapters, and then in the evenings we'd go for hikes. And uh, while we were hiking, uh, my wife would tell me that she really wanted me to create something new. She 
uh, love that I was revising, but she thought an artist residency, and my wife's a physical therapist, so she does not come from the world of, of writing or, uh, or really art, uh, but she kept saying, I want you to create something. I want you to create something. I don't want you to just uh, revise, and I was trying to figure out, well, what can I create that'll fit into the corners of this residency? And while we were at this residency, uh, there was a couple of things. One was that I was hiking all these trails that I had built. So 20 years ago, my, or I guess it was about 15 years before, my crew and I were literally right in this area, right on this mountain, swinging our tools, building all these trails. So I would tell her all about that turnpike or this switchback or this experience, um, you know, with a, a fire pit or whatever. And, uh, and then the other thing is the conservation core cabin that I was staying at had trail tools and this is a poem about that and uh, what I realized is that I should be writing trail poems so I started writing these trail poems back in 2011 just trying to, uh, to create something new at this residency this is called balance point and starts the book I discover a Pulaski a trail tool I haven't cradled in a dozen years Leaned under the eaves of this, of this civilian conservation corps cabin, convert it into a writing residency. And I bear this cutting tool into a nearby meadow of quavering lilies and irises, and I find its balance point. At a dead end down, I raise the axe edge above my head and drive hips and shoulder into the swing, feeling metal sliver air before blade chaws into pine. Fists of bark and sapwood leap like spawning sockeye salmon surging upriver. I swing again and again, showering this meadow and trees rays, realizing so many things have changed these years, but some things remain, though hidden, in our fibers of muscle, remembering and always ready. So that's how the book starts, and, and that's very close to the very end of the book. Uh, and then the book moves right to the very beginning where I got a job with the Northwest Youth Corps, and it's all about my life. And before being in the Northwest Youth Corps, I was uh, traveling state to state. I'd lived uh, in about a third of the U.S. Um, just for the fun of it. I was living in an apartment, a cabin, a shed, uh, living in my car, just living anywhere I wanted. And then I got the, the chance to work for the Northwest Youth Corps. And uh, once I got the job, I went to a training, and it was 10, week, uh, 10 days in the backcountry learning all about trail building. And one of the experiences with, uh, that I got to learn was how to work on a, trail, uh, a chainsaw. I'd never run one before, never broken it down. And they taught us how to take it all apart, put it all back together, and then of course how to use it. And this poem is called Dismemberment of a Steel Chainsaw. And then I'll pause right here because I keep thinking about this. But all these poems, at least in my mind, I have a direct connection to how they tie back to myth. And the only one I'll talk about right now is, uh, I wrote an essay a while ago about memory in creative nonfiction, and people are always wondering about truth in creative nonfiction. And uh, I think the, the writer almost always fails at truth in creative nonfiction. We try our best, but we just can't do it based on the human experience. Uh, and one of the things that essay talks about is that a, a myth is something that a culture believes to be completely true. Um, while the reader or the outsider sees it as maybe something less than true. And to me, creative nonfiction, which is what I'm reading from, even though it's in poems, is, uh, is that way. So this is what I believe is my truth, but it's, uh, you all might say, hey, that doesn't sound right. Or I know that story is not right. Or later on, we'll meet some other people and they might disagree with my story or have their own views. So that's the only thing I wanted to talk about memory right now. So we'll go back to our chainsaw and each sapped component flywheel, sprocket cover, chain catcher laid before us leaders in training a dissection, directions without a roadmap, scattered seed from a flower. We study this orange saw as one studies a new lover, learn how this hard burl of engine misfires unless cared for like a child. These parts come alive, change tense, tensioner gas oil mixture, carburetor box, hex nuts, and clutch cover. They become organs, blood, lungs, joints, mechanical skin. Dogs we purr, awed by sharp biting pivots. Our round files pause on the one element that rips apart these forests. The chain, teeth sharpened and glistening. 
I literally have two different timers all set up so I know right when my time is done and I forgot to start either one of them. Good job, me. The uh, next poem I want to talk about is, uh, <laughs> now I keep thinking about myth and I want to talk about that, but I'm going to ignore that for now. When you work in the woods, one of the things you look forward to, at least I did, was disappearing from society, leaving it all behind. But one of the things you give up is any access to your bigger community. So I would go for a week or two or sometimes four weeks in the backcountry without seeing anyone other than my crew. And then you'd come out and you'd have half a day to make every single phone call you needed to make. And this is in the days before cell phones, days of uh, pay phones. Uh, so at best, you'd get uh, an answering machine if you were lucky. And this is a, a poem about pay phones. At a Mustang gas station stop, I find an empty payphone booth and call across our massive continent to tell Catherine I found a new world, bigger than anything I've dreamt. Like when you found God, I long to whisper. I long to tell her I love her one final time. We'll call in three weeks, early May, once logger boots next kiss concrete. It is night at this Mustang, later night in her city. Tonight, I am drunk on summer, on fatigue on the task ahead. My hand strokes the coiled cord as I listen to her phone ringing unanswered. So after training, we would get, we would go back to uh, Eugene, Oregon, and uh, we'd go back to this old school and 40 youth would show up. And it was kind of like an, uh, a hockey, you know, National Hockey League draft or something where these 40 youth would get broken up onto four different crews. And uh, my bosses did all this and they would look at the youth and they might know them or might not know them. Some are coming from the court system for anything as little as, say, smoking pot to anything as big as attempted murder. And uh, they would divvy them up, but then there'd be honors, roles, kids, and they were trying to create some sort of balance crew you you know you'd have some challenging kids you'd have some good kids and uh i remember so this poem is about getting my first crew and it's called trail crew day one i drive this new crew of teens south on oregon's i-5 towards the poison oak infested infected infested cascade range six teens paid hourly slump in the row seats of our shimmering white van Apathetic faces gaze at blurred furs as we abandon Eugene for spring and summer in tents. When we return, April flowers will be replaced by autumn leaves. In the rear view, I scan faces trying to tease out history. Today, I can only guess. For a first time trail leader, it can't get much worse. Strings, a, her a homeless heroin dabbler who plays guitar. Cirrus, hooked on pot and breaking into houses to get money to smoke himself away. Red, a shy, red-haired McDonald's assistant manager, one of only two women on our crew, along with Stacy, a meth addict who will be here so few days, we will never know her myths. Boone, recently out of alcohol rehab, wears wavy black hair and a ponytail like Shiloh, except Shiloh sports a smiley face wound, ear to Adam's apple, the ear, a week old and scabbed, someone tried to saw his head off. The seven of us today, strangers, will spend months building trails, returning to primitive. Today, tomorrow, the five months ahead, I will learn this crew the way rock learns erosion, incrementally. So now we're off and living in the woods, and uh, the woods experience was wonderful. You'd spend days, weeks, months in the woods. Uh, the food was horrendous, but besides that, uh, so much of it was cool. And uh, I mean, there's plenty of hard parts. Working with these at-risk youth was always a challenge, though I loved it. Um, working on trails was great, though hot and sweaty. Uh, the first of this was nothing but uh, rain and snow. But one of the joys was you had these quiet moments every once in a while, say on a weekend, and you just have these short, beautiful experiences. And here's one called Boulder Creek. I ask you to close your eyes a moment, then open them to that babbling creek. Was its name? Maybe Boulder Creek or Rattlesnake or some other name so beautiful you long to hold it in your mouth. Run your tongue across the sound. Hush its name back into the full moon breeze. Let the creek 
course its way towards the North Umpqua River. This moment I learned life is too big to hold. It is only something to be tasted, a savoring. The longer I uh, lived in the woods, two things happened. One is you got more and more tired. If you were a leader, well, if you were a member, you were required by law to get eight hours of sleep. So we had to make sure that they were in their tents by, say, uh, eight o'clock at night. And then we would get up, say, four o'clock in the morning. We always tried to get an early start to the day. And then uh, the crew leaders then would do all their individual work then. So we do all of our paperwork, debrief with uh, anyone else that was there with us. So we might not get to bed till 1030 or 11. Uh, so we were running on six, seven hours uh, of sleep plus, you know, a nine hour day of work. So we got more and more fatigued. But then the other thing is you just got removed from the rest of the world. And uh, I remember coming out uh, early in the experience and getting a newspaper. This is out in Oregon. And before Columbine, there was a school shooting. And I remember it was, uh, the entire newspaper was dedicated to it. Uh, every article was about it. And uh, it just seemed like the most important thing in the world. And uh, every radio station was playing it. And then you go into the woods and you completely forget about it because there's not a hint of it. And then we came out the next weekend and it was still the only topic of discussion that was really getting any headlines. And we just lived this weird life where when you'd come out, for you know six eight hours you'd have to learn everything but for the most part you were in a world where hog hose mattered more than newspapers and this is a poem called stripping and it's about that experience week by week we grow toward a condensed language words disremembered abandoned from tents and saw packs what use for the word sink when might we utter closet or phone or bank account these words unneeded as a third thumb Unneeded as money or credit card, girlfriend becomes little more than a weekend dream. After four weeks of woods, woods living, I give you TV. I give you movie theater and radio. Do you want, want more words that these backwood winds strip away? Take traffic jam, take fuel pump, take nine to five. God, take commuting, take Howard Stern, take pavement, take concrete, take, we beg of you, microwaves and power lines, take nightly news. We give each and every one away because these industrial words taint our wild new memories. And I hadn't thought about this before, but maybe in this age of social isolation, social isolation, we're all experiencing something like this where we're giving away so many of these words as unneeded. Um, uh, now I'm gonna read you the uh, poem about the exact inverse, or at least a little bit of it. Uh, about what is lost when we give up away all these words. It's called Love Song. Remember when I told you this crew had disremembered so many words, how we gave away cable TV, desk, VCR, coffee maker, back to society, begged you to dispose of them, just broken sound glass in the mouth. Forget all that. For now, think of two months living in a tent, week on spikes without showers or shaving, days without changing hickory shirt or boxers, clothes, Failed to rags, stained of earth, everything is conceived of rock and dirt anyway. I need to talk about an aching. Another crew leader and I, we spent the night in Hood River tonight. He and I are human and in love with our women thousands of miles away. We also need something stronger than iodine treated water. So we head into a midday bar, but I'm meandering. I find a payphone slide quarters into its hard belly. Catherine is everything. I'm not pole sitting lights dance club marble lights burn to the butt hands of clay her voice huddled in a megapolis of subway lines and tunnels why is it so easy to talk to you not her she fusses across phone lines about kissing lips not mine I sever the line and stumble not yet drunk towards the bar this June night Ethan teaches me the last lessons of drinking to excess, waking up in some $40 motel to an alcohol fog, and there was once possibility. Come haze morning, no one loves me except the perfect balance of Pulaski. I have no home except that echoing tent, that sleeping bag, that no matter how tightly it sheaths this body, never feels like arms, like thin lips. This exact moment, I commit only to cruise, to trails. And, uh, and I did, I, I 
for the next many years, I spent most of my time living and working in the backwoods. I would come out uh, in the winters and, and ski and live in some remote town like Chama, New Mexico, uh, and then go right back into the woods. And I spent years and years uh, living in the woods. Um, now, see, now you, your people are writing comments, and now I'm looking down at them. We got to stop that, folks. No nice stuff, all right? I'll kick you out. Lindsay, if I, if I send you an email, just kick them right out. I'm looking at you, Dom. I'm looking at you, Brianne. All right. Um, and, uh, and working in the woods, like I said, was incredible, but, uh, at times you'd be just exhausted and the crew members would be super taxing. Um, uh, and this is a poem about that is why am I yelling? I'll tell you why. And the title is a part of it. So I'll read it again. Why am I yelling? I'll tell you why I'm yelling strings because you're late every freaking morning because you left the bastard filed out last night. And now it's rust because you and Boone argue each night about how messy your tent is rather than cleaning it the hell up. Because Sears burned last night's rice even after I told him I could smell the burn. Because I haven't dreamed six hours of sleep in weeks. Because my feet are trenched from working under rain and in Whiskey Creek. Because my thumb is a knob of undoctored pus. Because I haven't kissed a girl in 93 days and I haven't seen a girl I can kiss in 26. And Catherine is kissing someone nameless. Because my tent sleeps on a bed of granite, so the only thing I can hold at night is rock. Because I'm sick of being a leader, desperate for one night at the Trophy Room Bar in Prospect, Oregon. So we can complain about you, all of you. But since I can't tell any of you this, I commiserate only with Cedars. And they're miserable conversationalists. All right, and now we're heading towards the end of the woods. We'll read about three or four more poems. And uh, this is just a, a poem about the things that I'll miss in the coming days. So we're just a day. You know, actually, I'm going to read a different poem. Uh, this is a poem. This is a literary poem. I normally have to explain a lot of this to people. But I hope you all know Gilgamesh. It's the oldest written book. And it's about the king Gilgamesh and his nemesis at first in Kidu. And this is, again, at the end of the experience. And Enkidu is an all-powerful beast, but then uh, he loses that beast when he is seduced. And this is called Becoming Enkidu, Losing Enkidu. After months constructing trails, digging society from our bones, this crew has transformed into Enkidu before he loved Shamhat. When he spoke the language of those who ate grass and drank from water holes, at our end, I fear Enkidu's spirit deserts us. Each of us soon exiled as Nkidu was. Too soon we return to the rule of ruining cities, no longer home beside bear and elk, no longer drinking from crystalline creeks. And now we're at the very end of the book. I've uh, left the trail crew. I've retired from that life. And now uh, I'm uh, in Michigan. I'm in Grand Rapids. And I uh, own a house there. I'm working at Grand Valley State University. And I'm thinking back to my days. And it's called Lockwood Avenue, which is where I lived. When it is lonely here in Grand Rapids and those wildernesses seem so much further than the behind the 100th meridian, I pace the confines of this house until I end up in my living room closet, flipping through 12-year-old photo albums. I almost need earthen images into Duffy Peninsula soil or St. Helens ash dirt. Leaning closer towards these snapshots, I feel wet winds sloughing off. Instead of these closet walls, a blanket, a devil's club. Instead of hardwood floors, towering false cedars. Fingers on photos, I realize that if I had Pulaski'd this world, there would be no straight shot highways, no nine to five, no subdivision, subdivisions assembly lined into broken images of Abraham Levitt's and son. I set down photos and stumble into nightfall of mortgaged houses, bury my face into this yard's only tree, then low into dirt's reek. And now the final poem will take us right back to where we started, which is at that artist residence with my wife and I, and we're hiking these trails. And I'm just thinking back to the experience. And this is called Return to Primitive. After a, week, after a week of writing these very trail poems, it's time to leave these glacier peaks. I cooler food, fold sheets, sweep the kitchen until this cabin swims in dust 
and sunlight. And soon it's as I've never spent a night in this log bunk, never wandered these tangled woods. When the cabin's interior is cleaned, I store the plastic in the cloud. As I set these trail tools aside, wishing I had brought a file to sharpen their dulled edges, I notice not for the first time that these soft artist fingers have grown callous from holding the burled belly and throat of the Pulaski's handle. In one week, it all returned, except those crew members. I've nearly returned to primitive. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. Oh, that's gorgeous. We're going to have to talk trail building sometime. Uh, UICC alum. So we'll connect on that. The comments are starting to come in. <laughs> um, and as they do, I'm going to ask Anne to go ahead and come off mute. You are okay. up next, friend. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. Um, and I, my, I see my sister and my brother are here. Hi. <laughs> and my friend Paola, which was a surprise, so I'm excited. I'm going to read from Five Midnights. Um, it's my young adult novel that came out last year. And the reason I chose to read from this rather than the new book is because of the, the myth theme. Um, this book is actually about um, El Cuco who is a, um, it's a Latinx myth um, that actually began in, well, you'll hear some stories. You'll hear within the context of the, the novel. Um, but you're going to hear from three main characters or three characters. Um, Lupe, who is a half Puerto Rican uh, Vermont resident. Um, and she's down in Puerto Rico and she's trying to help solve a series of murders. Her uncle is the chief of police. Um, and Javier and Izzy, who are, Izzy's her cousin, and Javier is a romantic interest, and their, their friends are being murdered one by one, and so they're trying to figure out what's going on and why these young men are dying. So um, this comes at the scene where they're trying to figure that out. So I've never read this in a reading because it's in the middle of the book, but I thought it was the, the best part to sort of demonstrate the myth theme. The three, the three of them drove around for an hour while they talked about how little they knew. They discussed the possibility of revenge, rival dealers, and enemies. Nothing seemed to fit. After they exhausted their ideas, they sat in a moment of frustrating silence as they cruised down the highway. That's when Lupe saw the poppy gringo billboard. El Cuco! Both boys looked at her. What? Lupe was talking fast, but she couldn't help it. Just hear me out. Fico's grandmother talked about retribution when I saw her in El Rubí. Izzy scoffed. Vico's abuela? She must be 106. And what the hell were you doing in El Rubí? She seemed pretty sharp to me. Plus, there's the words to the Papi Gringo song. They stared back at her. Oh, do not tell me you haven't listened to the lyrics. Javier shrugged. Izzy said, hey, I've been busy. Wait, there's a photo of you with Papi Gringo online. I saw it at one of his concerts. I didn't stay for the actual concert. Lupe sighed, some friends you guys are. The song is all about retribution. She loved knowing more about something Puerto Rican than they did. They didn't have to know she'd only learned about it yesterday from Tere. She pulled out her phone and pulled up Spotify. Let's just play it. Does this car have Bluetooth? Izzy and Javier looked at each other for a second, then burst out laughing. When they could finally breathe again, Izzy said, girl, this car doesn't have a single tooth. Javier added, it's toothless. They started laughing all over again until tears were running down their cheeks. Oh, for God's sake, Lupe reached for the radio dial and searched through the, through the stations as the guys did the high five, good one, bro thing over her head. They were lucky she didn't punch them both toothless. It only took a few minutes until the station was playing Carlos's hit. Lupe waited as the boys listened to the lyrics. She had to bite her tongue after the closing notes. Did they hear the connections that she heard? Javier clicked the radio off. Izzy took a deep intake of breath. Damn. Lupe smiled wide. Right? Carlos doesn't suck. Javier responded, yeah, homeboy's got some talent. Lupe was dumbfounded. What, that's all you got from that? Javier shrugged. It's just a song. Wait, hold up. Lupe the sensible isn't suggesting that El Cuco is after us, are you? The smile threatened to split her cousin's face. 
No. What about all that talk about retribution of life pumping through a needle? And El Cuco's cure will conjure that. What if somebody is trying to reproduce the myth of El Cuco? It's just Carlos writing about how we grew up. Lupe slumped down in the seat. I'm sorry, I just don't think it has anything to do with what's going on. Yeah, cuz, you've been watching too many movies. Things just aren't that interesting in real life. As she sulked in silence, part of Lupe agreed with them that it was crazy to believe there were clues in the song. But another part, a deeper, older part, knew that unconsciously enough, Carlos had hit on something with his song. Something bad. Grr. Lupe growled at her phone as Javier inched them through traffic. What are you growling about, Lupe? Javier asked, the only one who wasn't completely absorbed in a phone. There's like nothing about El Cuco on the internet. I mean, chupacabras are everywhere. Why not this legend? Dark bullshit like that sells. There isn't a lot about the island on the internet. When I did a paper on the Tainos, I had to go and talk to people, visit historical sites. There was some information, a few books, but more often than not, I got information from talking to people. Speaking of which, Izzy handed Lupe his phone. She read the text as the car inched through traffic. It had to be from an adult. It was in complete sentences. Isidore, I got your message about the legend of El Cuco. It might help if you talk to a gentleman who is an expert on the subject. Ernesto Quinones is a professor of anthropology at the University of Puerto Rico. Semi-retired as he's very elderly. His specialty is island mythology, and he wrote many of the articles you access through the library. Perhaps it would help to go straight to the source. I have pasted his contact information below. I hope this is helpful. She smacked her cousin on the shoulder. You were researching El Cuco after laughing at me when I brought up Carlos's song? Izzy shrugged. I got a library friend. A librarian friend. Javier smiled. Friend? Izzy sneered. Not like that. She's like 50. She just likes me and I read a lot. Javier looked over at him. What did your friend say? Lupe read that he read him the text. Javier took the next exit to, to start in the other direction. Let's go talk to this professor. The campus was a half an hour away in Rio Piedras, and luckily traffic was light. They parked and made their way across the campus to the main building. It felt like any other college campus she'd seen in the past. The daily life of the university buzzed around them, but she was surprised by the cracks in the sidewalk where tree roots pushed through the minimal landscaping, bald patches on the grass. When they arrived at the main building, the ornate painted carvings on the columns caught her attention. It was like a scruffy peacock, rough around the edges, but still parading around with its colorful tail high. <clears throat> Excuse me. The guard pointed to some stairs that led to the professor's office. The three of them made their way up an ornate staircase surrounded by rich murals featuring images of the arts, science, and culture. Lupe was mesmerized. The hallway to the office opened on one side to the courtyard, sunshine and possibly blue skies and palm fronds blowing in the breeze. The side of the building with the offices was stone, dark and somewhat forbidding. They found the large green wooden door framed on either side by slatted windows, the shutters closed tight. As Javier knocked, Lupe whispered, I hope to God there's air conditioning in there. After a minute or two of silence, a very handsome young man with dimples opened the door. Can I help you? We're here to see Professor Quinones. We have an appointment. A crackly voice yelled from farther inside. Let them in, Armand. Let's get this over with. Izzy snorted. Oh, I have such a warm and fuzzy feeling about this. When they stepped inside, it was like entering a different world. No air conditioning. The room was like a sauna and lit only by ornate lamps positioned haphazardly around the room. If there were any windows, they were shuttered like the ones in the front. The office appeared to be two rooms. The first, the one they were in, had a worn wooden desk behind which Armand looked bored. But what was most striking, striking was the almost every surface in the room, including the floor, was covered with saint statues of varying heights. From six inches to six feet, there were hundreds of them. Rustic wood, ornately painted ceramic, pockmarked gray stone. Each one was different, but one thing they all had in common, their eyes were looking at them. Their raptur rapturous gazes followed them around the room until Lupe thought she might crawl out of her skin. El Cuco himself could be hiding among them and she'd never know. She noticed rows of darkened fluorescent lights above and for a minute considered finding the switch and flipping them on just to shine some light on the creepy scene. An impatient voice barked at them in Spanish from the interior room. Lupe couldn't wait to see what was in there. 
She let Izzy and Javier go first, following quiet, quietly behind, taking everything in. The light in this room was limited to small spotlights shining on the walls, showcasing the incredible art from floor to ceiling. Oil paintings of blazing orange flamboyant trees, spiky vejigante festival masks in bright colors, pencil drawings of men working the sugarcane fields, every piece tied to the culture of the island. The room was dominated by a huge, ornately carved dark wooden desk at its center, its top obscured by piles of books, papers, and an ancient typewriter. The room smelled like old newspapers, leather, and menthol. If you bottled it, you could call it Oh, the old academic. She almost giggled at the thought. Lupe realized everyone had gone silent and looked over to find Javier, Izzy, and a tiny man with a full head of wild white hair sitting behind the desk staring at her. Sorry, I was distracted by the incredible. The old man waved at her impatiently and asked in slow, precisely enunciated Spanish, I was asking who you are, dear. Lo siento, yo soy Lupe. He cut her off in clipped British-tinged English. Why don't we stick to English for her sake, hmm? I have no desire to listen to yet another gringa massacre our beautiful language. Lupe narrowed her eyes at the old man. Izzy snorted, and Javier's eyes darted to her. Professor, Lupe's father is from... It doesn't matter. She's still a gringa. Pity so many islanders with good Spanish blood had to muddy the waters by intermarrying and breeding. He pronounced the last word as if he just saying it repulsed him. Lupe had had enough. Look. I don't need, yes, yes, I know, you North Americans offend so easily. So let's just get this over with and before your little blonde friend winds up and hits me, yes? What is it you, you want people, want, young people want from an old man? For a beat, they all just stared at him, mouths open. To say that Professor Quinones was not what they expected would be the understatement of the year. Javier coughed. Yes, senor, we, uh-uh, doctor. Please, I didn't spend all those years in graduate school at Oxford to be addressed without the proper respect. Lupe could see Javier's jaw tighten. At least the old man was getting on all of their nerves. Well, maybe not on Izzy's, he seemed to be enjoying himself. He noticed Lupe looking at him, coughed and wiped the smile off his face, then pulled out the diplomat side that Javier was always talking about. Dr. Quinones, por favor, we are trying to learn more about the myth of El Cuco. The professor held up his index finger as if lecturing to a room of students. Myth? Men have always relegated whatever they don't understand to myth. I would wait until you learn more before you call it a myth. Lupe scoffed. You're not saying you believe in monsters. You, a fancy college professor with all those letters after his name. The professor tented his fingers below his chin and stared at Lupe, looking into her eyes until she started to squirm. Not only is that what I'm saying, but if I were a betting man, I would wager my rather meager retirement savings that your two handsome friends there have actually seen monsters in the flesh, as it were. Lupe looked from Javier to Izzy, the old man's words sitting like a, on the desk like paperweights. Well, sure, metaphorical monsters. The professor cut her off. Right, I thought so. He went back to addressing Izzy. So you seem like a reasonably intelligent young man. Lupe snorted. Izzy leaned over and whispered, you're not helping. The professor continued, but she could tell he was getting truly aggravated. What is it you want to know about El Cuco that she hasn't already found on the internet and dismissed as a Hispanic superstition? He gestured in Lupe's direction. Lupe could feel her face redden. It only made her angrier that he seemed to know so much about them. He didn't seem to expect an answer, though, because before Izzy could say a word, he continued in full lecture mode. I assume you know his origins, that the legend appears in almost every Hispanic culture, though his name varies. He's called El Cucuy in Mexico, for instance. The legend was first encountered in Portugal with the coco, referring to the slang word for head or skull. Parents in Hispanic cultures threaten their children with some version of the same monster. monster. They tell their offspring that the monster was lurking on the roof, watching to see if they misbehaved. Talk about giving kids something to bring up in therapy. Young lady, there are thousands of scary tales used to frighten small children. Hansel and Gretel, Little Red Riding Hood, why Jamaica's duppy. Yeah, yeah, I got it. He sneered at her. You Norte Americanos are raised to be so polite. Lupe grinned. About as polite as college professors, it seems. Izzy stepped forward. Okay, children, let's calm down. Quinones ignored that comment and turned to Izzy. It seems you know everything, so what more can I tell you? Izzy spoke, serious now. Why does he come? El Cuco, I mean. The professor stood, and Lupe was surprised at how tall he was. 
His long, lean frame had been so folded in the overstuffed leather chair that she thought him tiny. He was thin and impeccably dressed in a white suit with a black tie. He straightened up with some effort then began to pace along the far wall, one hand in the pocket of his suit vest, the other occasionally brushing his neatly trimmed white beard. There are theories among cultural anthropologists and psychologists that he represents a supernatural manifestation of childhood fears and that sightings of him increase with the unrest of the culture, much like the zombies and vampires that have had their own renaissance of late. And you can think, then who can think of a time that, that our poor island has been in a higher state of unrest? In the late, it was Javier's turn to cut him off. But why do you think he comes? Quinones stopped pacing. After a moment, his face rearranged itself into a smile. I think it's very simple, my boy. He comes because he's called. As he stepped forward, but by who? Whom? By whom? I insist on proper grammar in my office. Izzy gave Lupe a look as if she should be enjoying this. The professor continued, El Cuco has always been what parents threaten their children with in order to get them to behave. My theory is that he's a physical manifestation of the very limits of a parent's control over their children. It is he they turn to when they no longer have any influence. And in calling him, they hand the power over to him. Lupe saw Javier and Izzy share a look. Something struck a chord with them, and she was going to find out what it was the minute they left the old cook's office, what she, what she wanted to do sooner rather than later. So she put her hands on her hips and stood in the way of the professor's pacing. In the interest of getting the hell out of there, she decided to just play along. Okay, so hypothetically, how does one destroy El Cuco in these legends? Quinones put his hand on her shoulder and laughed, loud and long. The three of them just looked at each other as tears ran from the man's wrinkled eyes. Oh, this was getting old fast. She was about to take his hand and judo throw the geezer into the hard floor. Finally, he caught his breath, took a bright white handkerchief from his jacket pocket and wiped his eyes. I'm so sorry, dear, but it's so amusing how you North Americans are so anxious to destroy everything that gets in your way. It's so very John Wayne of you. He then began to clean his glasses with the handkerchief. Most cultures live quite contentedly with their monsters, except yours, of course. He put his glasses back on and regarded Lupe. You can't destroy El Cuco. He's woven into the very fabric of the island's culture. Izzy's hands clenched into fists. Then how do we call him off? Lupe put her hand up. Now, wait a minute. You don't really believe that a monster is. The professor ignored her once again. You can't. You have to give him what he wants. Javier's turn. What does he want? Retribution. They all looked at one another. Retribution from Carlos's song ran through Lupe's head, and she was sure it did in both of theirs. What did it mean, though? She had to ask. Retribution for what? Ah, that's the question, isn't it? When you think about it, the cuckoo is rather gorgeous in his simplicity. He manifests for one purpose and one purpose only. As for your query, retribution for some transgression, whatever a parent might consider bad behavior, I imagine. Bad, but that's way too subjective and vague a descriptor on which to base supernatural vengeance. The professor clapped his hands. How delightful, the gringa is intelligent. My dear, you must be like a unicorn in your hometown. I'm guessing somewhere in northern New England? Lupe had had it with the old man's crystal ball reading. Look, Professor Asshat, my friends and my family, she gestured towards Izzy, are in danger. There's something masquerading as El Cuco, and we just want to know how to stop him. Now see here, young lady, there was fire behind the old man's eyes, his pale face reddening as he yelled. You can't come into an old man's office, insult him, and demand information. So typical of Norte Americano, so self-righteous. If I had my way, he stopped and staggered a bit, and Javier reached out to take his elbow, but the professor ripped his arm back, losing his balance again. The assistant appeared in the doorway and rushed to the professor as Quinones whined, Armand, Armand, get these ingrates out of my office. Armand talked softly and coaxed the professor back to his chair. Armand turned to, toward them, but they had already ducked for the door, happy to be leaving Professor Quinones' depressing cave. Armand followed and pushed them out the door, and they heard the lock click after them. All three stood in the hallway, stunned, mouths hanging open again. Well, that was helpful. Izzy's voice was flat. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was fun. Thank you all for <laughs> listening. Hmm. Wonderful. And again, the comments are coming in. So good to hear you read, Anne. <laughs> um, once everyone, uh, once I see the loving chats slow down, I'm going to put the links to order books up in our chat room again. So um, please copy those down and uh, order books by our lovely authors, support um, from local Vermont bookstores um, and our readers tonight. And um, we're going to transition now. Deb Otri is going to lead the salon discussion on myth with Sean and Anne. Um, and that'll go for about 20 minutes, so until around 7.15, and then we'll wrap up with just a few minutes of Q&A when audience members can chime in with, with your questions as well, and we'll wrap up around 7.30. So, um, Doubletree and Sean, if you, if you both want to come off mute, I will turn this back over to you. Hey, so you can hear me, right? Okay, yep. cool. So I was going to suggest, let's do uh, maybe about 15 minutes of our, our conversation and that way we'll have about 20 minutes for audience discussions just because there's so many lovely people in the audience and we want to hear from all of you and, uh, you know, and have you be a part of it. So, um, yeah, so, so let's do that because I think we've... Um, kind of, we've, we've done our readings, I think. Um, we've also established in so many ways its relationship with the idea of myth. I was just making a few notes while both of you were reading and sort of talk, thinking about, you know, what I want to talk about when we talk about myth. And I, I know I said um, earlier, too, that it comes from the Greek mythos or word. And so in that sense, it's central, right? I mean, just even linguistically, uh, it's, it's central to everything. It's central to, uh, to language, to culture, to being. Um, the anthropologist Malinowski had described it as the only essential ingredient of all cultures. Everything else being optional, myth is something that all cultures have. And that's a very interesting idea that it um, breeds life into the cultural universe of a peop people. Uh, it demarcates the contours of collective consciousness. Um, it's a very broad category, again, to emphasize that, um, that it's um, not just religious ep uh, you know, myths, but we have epics, legends, uh, folklore, some of you talk about fairy tales, um, and then there's, you know, all of these other sort of um, kinds of myth-making, political myth-making, um, cultural myth-making. History is also a story we tell ourselves. A lot of history is historiography, particularly. We like to tell ourselves that history is just a recording of facts, and in that very positivist understanding, we overlook how history is often told by the winners, the victors, it's their side. And so again, you know, it's, it's a story we tell ourselves. Um, and so, uh, so in that way, myths in many ways sort of constitute this abstract meaning system within which concrete self-understandings of institutions and individuals become shaped. And so, Another way to look at myths is to see them as something that's relegated to the past and to historical memory. But again, it's important to remember that it's always in conversation with the present. And so it's never really only of the past. And in fact, um, myths draw their power from the fact that that sort of telling of the past keeps molding our cultural imaginary in the present. And so in that sense, the line that I said earlier, that even as we narrate our myths, our myths narrate us. And so there's a narrative need. At the, at the end of it, that's what we're talking about, that there's a narrative need that myths fulfill for, for culture, for ourselves. I love that part in your story uh, when you were saying, Anne, that, um, that, that this particular myth, begin, uh, myth begins at the limits of where parental influence ends. It's like, we can't really control the kids anymore, so hey, there's that monster. And I was thinking of my mother and all the stories she told us and how we thought it was true till so late, you know, into our adulthood. My mother also had the story about a petrol pump monster. I don't know if anybody else's mother did that to them. Mine did. So there was this, you know, there's this, the, the, the hose through which, you know, that hose type of thing, I don't know what is the terminology for, uh, for, for that, but, you know, through which the, the oil comes out. 
she said that that's the spout of the monster and the rest of him is underground. And, uh, and so, so, you know, so we've got, you know, these stories and, um, and so to the extent that it acts as an agent of social legitimation of the past and the present, the continuation of the present into the future, um, we're really talking about the collective power of the social here, right? We have, myths have a collective, coll collective function. And that's also why it becomes so important to rewrite myth because to unwork and rework our mythic imaginations of you know, gender and class and race or whatever you will, uh, it's very important to tackle where it all begins and sort of go back to those myths. So that's my, my take on myths and how it's a very powerful uh, way to understand history, to understand culture. It's a powerful tool for us as writers. Um, so many good books in history and down you know, the ages have really been about retellings of stories in so many different ways. And so, um, so I wanted to open it up to both of you in the first instance. Um, Sean, I was wondering about, because I know you were kind of, you know, when you were reading, um, you were talking about it, but then you were like, no, no, I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to then. So d did you want to talk a little, a little bit about it now, and particularly the kind of mythic universes that you saw yourself constructing and crafting in that, um, in that work? Yeah, yeah, I guess the one thing I'm thinking about, especially as you talk, is um, you were talking about kind of cultural myths and historical myths, and I'm thinking also about, again, personal myths and how all of us, but especially writers, think of uh, our lives as having some sort of story or, or narrative arc, and this is how I came to be, but we're really all we are is just a, a collection of individual moments that just uh, happen to live next to each other or happen to be 10 years apart. And then the human, the writer, constructs a, a narrative. And I think myth also means plot, if I, if I remember that correctly. And we just construct a plot of our lives, a narrative of our, of our histories, mm -hmm. create some myth of who we are. And it could be a, a, a myth that's empowering to us, a myth that's, uh, that steals our strength, but it's not really true. And I think about that with, with Crosscut, that's just one small part of my life, but it's the part that, it's the myths that I tell about myself. It's the ones I latch onto. And then there's these other stories that I just ignore because they don't fit into the myth I've decided to construct. Mm -hmm. I think there was another, um, there was a line when you were reading your poems that struck out to me a lot. You were talking about home. And particularly in, you know, that sort of space of nature and woods and trails and so forth. And you said home is a sleeping bag. And I was just, I mean, I, I found that to be such a beautiful line because it just, I mean, you're just saying it all in that one brief line. In that world, that's what home is. And then it sort of made me think about how the most powerful amount of myth making happens around the idea of home who belongs, who doesn't, political myth-making, history. Um, and so each side tells the story very differently. But to us, it's true. Our, our truth is the only truth, but the other side sees it very differently. Um, so I was wondering if you uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship of myth and home, whether in the sense of, you know, um, of, of the sort of wooded universe that you were creating for us and also talking about it in terms of the social isolation that we are all currently undergoing, but also maybe in a, in a larger um, sense, if you wanted to. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I never thought that home mattered that much to me. I mentioned this earlier, but I've lived in 13 different, uh, 16 different states. And, uh, I moved oftentimes every three months, every six months, and I was always looking for uh, the next adventure opportunity. Mm -hmm. I never thought I would ever settle down. And then uh, I wish I could turn my computer around because as uh, you both were reading, I was loving the words, but I was also watching the wind move across my lake. And it's this wonderful experience. And somehow now I'm deeply rooted here and I'm realizing that uh, everything I, I've write, all my books end up being about home and finding Abby was about looking for home. Crosscut was about uh, searching for home in the woods and searching for a community. And then all my future books are going to deal with that as well. But I think, you know, again, much like I was talking about the myth of who we are, we're always trying to feel like an insider in our worlds. Mm. And 
unfortunately, maybe for almost all of us, we almost always feel like outsiders in some way. So home is always something elusive. It's something elsewhere. And uh, I know I get hung up on writing about that a lot. Mm. I think that's so beautiful. Home is elsewhere. Because I know we were talking about, you know, we were having this discussion around some political themes around immigration and so forth uh, for the last uh, month and the students were greatly enjoying it. And we were talking about this line that a lot of, um, you know, individuals and communities are having to hear now, go back home, you know, go back home and, and, and uh, go back to your countries or go back to whatever. And not only is that very different from the global traveling vision that we have, but also I was thinking briefly about how, how do you go back home? Because that space changes, right? I mean, it doesn't remain the same for us. You change, the space changes. The only way to go back home is never to have left it. But, you know, once you're out, you know, you change, the, the journey changes, the trajectory changes. And so, I mean, and, and, and you're so right that it's not only for immigrants. I mean, I think of di populations in the diaspora so much and a lot of my uh, creative and literary analysis is, ar is around um, people writing in the diaspora. But you're very right that everybody feels not at home in so many ways. And I'm also thinking of Thaju Cole's book and of known and strange spaces that we're all sort of learning to be at home in known and strange spaces because even for those who haven't moved, even their sense of home is changing all the time. And sometimes I also feel like reactionary politics is often nothing but a, a, an, a yearning for something that's no longer there and, and sort of, you know, trying to, again, get back to that sense of home. So, so, so many myths around that, right? So many myths around that. Um, and I was wondering if you would share a little bit more about that delightful, delightful myth that is just, I mean, I could literally see that monster. And I mean, I was just hoping you'd talk a little bit more about that. Sure. He's, he's very interesting. My, my mother was not very traditional, and so she didn't threaten me with monsters, besides the fact that I loved horror, so I would have not, it wouldn't have worked. You are um, very lucky. <laughs> my, my childhood was gore. <laughs> I, oh no, I I was my I had three brothers. It was lots of gore, but it didn't come from my mother. Um, but but she she didn't tell me about El Cuco. But I started to I read about him in in a magazine, and I said okay. And I started asking friends from different cultures, and they said, oh yeah, you know we had this version. And and my parents used to threaten me before I went to bed, and you know you better go to sleep, or El Cuco is going to get you. And I was like, what a horrible thing to do to children. And so I started to research him and there is not much information. Um, and so I just decided, it, like in, in the book, he takes the form of the fear of e the individual. So he, he does change form. Um, mm. And for me, you know, when I finished the book, it's a lot about addiction. Um, I grew up with a, an addict mother. And so it, to me, El, you know, El Cuco ends up being addiction. So it's sort of this concept of the myth sort of taking the shape of the individual story. Um, and it's so interesting because you were talking about home and, and in many ways, you know, I come from an oral storytelling culture and in many ways, um, myths are what root us in the culture. And I used to hear these family stories from my mother about life in Puerto Rico and, um, at one point I said something to her, she had passed on. I said something to her brother and I, you know, I told him the stories. He goes, those aren't true. And I was really upset. I was like, she lied to me. And then a cousin said, you know, Anne, the family is as defined by the stories that aren't true as by the ones that are. And so it's, it's, it has a family has its own mythology. And interestingly enough, last year I found out from their half brother that they all were true. So it's like this, you know, this sort of railroad of what, what's true and what isn't. And like Sean said, you know, I mean, it's all created on fiction, but mm -hmm. I just think El Cuco is, it was a, I wrote it at a time when as a parent, I felt particularly powerless. And so the idea of calling forth retribution for, for <laughs> transgressions was appealing <laughs> at the time. Something else that I also, um, was no, was sort of very uh, uh, cognizant of as you were reading was there's a lot going on in that novel. I mean, there's there's some very trenchant political critique, and you know, and it comes in through dialogues, it comes in through your characters, and I loved that. And you know, particularly how uh, you know the the usual framing of um, 
people of color in general as, you know, ignorant and so forth, the ignorant gringa and, you know, and how she sort of, you know, answers back and, uh, and, and they say, well, she's intelligent. Um, and I, and, and then you also had a reference to Oxford, which I greatly enjoyed having uh, been there myself. And uh, I remember when I, uh, my first day at Oxford was when um, I had this professor come up to me and uh, sort of be, uh, very, I mean, the white savior complex thing, sort of, uh, you know, if you need help, you know, if you're struggling, and I'm thinking, oh, you wait and watch, you know, and um, it was very interesting, because, I mean, Oxford has its, um, you know, the, the professors who teach us don't grade our papers, our work, it's all sent to external examiners, so we're numbers to them, they're numbers to us, nobody knows, so I was, I, I got my revenge when I got the distinction. Uh, when I got, you know, the brown girl got the distinction, but uh, but all of that was coming back when you were, you know, that that it's also it's it sometimes it's well-meaning, it's like let me help, but there's this just this idea of hierarchy and help and so forth. So I was wondering if you'd speak a little bit to that because a lot of our myth making around culture and superiority, cultural superiority, or you know, a lot a lot of that racial myths, things like that are very much a part of the political fabric of the world. And they've kept a certain uh, mainstream narrative of history going for centuries. So if yeah. you would just. Sure, there's a lot of anti-colonialism in my um, work, in all of my work. And, um, and in fact, when I was in um, copy edits for this, Hurricane Maria happened. And uh, I got very angry about how things were being handled. We were very nervous about my family. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote, Category five is actually even more anti-colonialist. So, um, you know, those are the kind of stories that I had. Um, so, so the thing about the, the gringa and the, it, it's actually that character is based on an experience my cousin had with a cousin of ours who is an academic. It also has a bit of the, of the um, uh, pretentiousness of academia. Mm -hmm. it, I grew up, my father's a professor. I grew up on the Columbia campus. I. Mm -hmm. You know, I have very low tolerance for it. And so he represented a bit for me that sort of judgment um, mm -hmm. and superiority. And mm -hmm. um, there, there are, you're right, there are layers because he's also a white Puerto Rican and he feels sort of okay. superior about his, his Spanish roots. And, mm -hmm. and so there's, there are layers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what a lot of it deals with. Mm, that's that's very very fascinating. So yes, I mean I think that that's that's great, and I mean uh, we could talk about this forever, right? But we could talk about this forever. But uh, uh, yeah, let's go over for to the questions with the audience because there's so many wonderful people here, and uh, your professors know you. I don't, so I'd like to see your faces and hear from you when I have, uh, you know, as long as I have a chance to do that for the next fifteen minutes. So let's do that. Um, audience questions, things that you want to ask us, things that you wanted to talk about. Um, for this portion, if folks, uh, if you haven't already, and if you're willing, please do uh, turn your camera on so we can see your faces. Um, and there's a few ways you can chime in depending on how brave you're feeling. Um, if you want to just take yourself off mute and jump in, go for it. If you are more comfortable typing your question into the chat box, um, we can read it out for you. Um, and you can also uh, chat in there, you know, I have a question and then take yourself off mute if you just, you know, want to make sure you don't talk over anybody else. That's all of those will work. Uh, and please do chime in. Um, the floor is open. as you're thinking of your questions, I also want to say to everybody, if any of you are, I know there's this plan, have this evil plan being hatched right now, visiting a certain lake that, of course, I cannot visit, being very far away. However, however, we have lakes here. And uh, if any of you are this side, please saunter, saunter across. I'm in the Women's Studies Department at uh, the U of M in Ann Arbor, but also um, uh, I would be very, very happy to have all of you uh, join in at some point or the other in, you know, different hummingbirds, the real hummingbird, the real thing where we're all together and, you know, we have that energy of, of bodies, you know, um, no social distancing. So I'd love for you to join in and, um, and you can write to me. And okay, I, I see Rita's taken the hint and she's saying we can invite you back for the lake trip. Okay, I will say yes to that. <laughs> and so and speaking of the lake, I'll jump in uh, until we get a question. I was uh, listening to what you and Anne were talking about. And one of the things, and this, I'm gonna tie it back to home. 
I live on a lake and I've got some neighbors nearby. And our political views uh, are really diverse. And some of that I really appreciate, some of that concerns me. But what I notice is that the closer you get to community, the more that politics often gets washed away by humanity. And what I mean by that is when my neighbors who have very different views than I do, we sit down and have a, a dinner together and we try to have a monthly dinner as a community, uh, much of our politics disappears and we become community and we norm ourselves to, a, to a, a, our new myth, our community myth. Mm -hmm. I think one of the problems with politics is that we forget to see each other as community members. We forget mm -hmm. to see each other as people who are part of our home, mm -hmm. um, from all sides. And uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as we think about home, as we think about the myths, something we just we can do is just get to know other people who disagree with us. Mm -hmm. Okay, come on, wonderful audience. We're waiting for your questions. Uh, one question I have kind of related to this idea of myth is um, how, does, how do myths that are personal and individual bump up against myths that are national and collective, right? So, um, so, you know, one thing, one example could be um, the selection from Five Midnights that Anne read, right, you know, where all of a sudden Lupe, who is, you know, she's, she's got this biracial identity, she's half white, she's half Puerto Rican, she thinks she knows who she is as an individual, very strong willed, um, she meets this professor and he dismisses her for being North American, right, like having these North American values and attitudes and even colonial ways and he's you know professor he's he's got his own kind of colonial stuff going on and he's a white uh you know uh, hispanic but i think that's the f it feels like one of the first times that lupe has to address that this kind of side of herself that she didn't even realize she was upholding a myth that um, she was enabling or recreating mm -hmm. in many ways that happens to Radha and that retelling of uh, the Radha and Krishna love story too, that um, she's, she wants to have agency and uh, break female archetype, but she is also enabling a lot of um, gender performance, right? She's, mm -hmm. she's recreating it, right? So, so what happens with the individual uh, story against the collective? Um, unconsciousness or collective constructs of myth? I think that's such a wonderful question. And I think, I mean, it, that's the eternal struggle, right? I mean, the indiv individual and social structure. Um, I think uh, something that I've used as a definition of agency for my classes is more the post-structuralist idea rather than the liberal idea of like, you know, you challenge your opposition and so forth. A post-structuralist idea is kind of more nuanced. I mean, I, I don't want to do ac academies, but I guess what I'm just trying to say is, that agency is always contextual, it's within a context. I mean, we simultaneously oppose as well as conform. We contest and conform. And so not all agency is necessarily only oppositional, nor can individual subjects only be oppositional, uh, you know, for all the entire duration of their lives and so forth. And so we take and we reject in multiple ways. But I think that, I mean, because even in her own way, she does get subsumed. You're right, so right that within the larger, larger collective uh, myth, she gets subsumed within that and much of the radical nature of her own agency is lost because it's, it's radical agency. She's married to one man. She says, I reject this. I did not love him. This was not the marriage I wanted. And so she steps out of that. And in many ways, she does not submit to Krishna's demands. And the Geet Govind is entirely about that, about how she's holding away. And she is, you know, so there's defiance and there's, and there's also a lot of subversiveness, even in the description. I don't want to go too much into it because I don't know how young uh, some of our, um, uh, our audience members are, but even in the lovemaking scenes, so there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's uh, cross-dressing, there's a lot of stuff going on there, which is pretty amazing. But I think that uh, the important thing is um, how 
just as the collective does take up, uh, the, you know, these tourism kind of uh, subsume it within itself. And uh, but, but by the same token, I think there is still some individual power and that we can kind of fashion it in our own ways. I want to share one thing very briefly uh, since I'm sharing little figurines I have here. So I have this of Saraswati. You know that probably, Rita, right? Saraswati. And uh, for the others, uh, this is the goddess of, right? So she is the goddess of learning. She's the goddess of education. And I tell my classes, when I talk to my classes, I say, well, you know, we worship her as herself. She's supposed to have a male consort. We don't really know. Uh, it's never part of the big, big picture. We just know her as herself and she writes books and she flies around. So I tell my classes, she's a single woman traveler like me. I mean, she flies around the world. She has a swan. Uh, you know, that's a, a feminist figure. So it's, it's reclaiming, right? It's reclaiming and different communities will do what they will with different kinds of figures. Uh, we might also have a community that is praying to the, uh, goddess of education as a woman and simultaneously denying education to its daughters. So we have that also, right? So, so different communities will use different things. But for me, she's been such an inspiring figure. It's like, you know, she's a single woman. She doesn't have children. She writes books and travels around the world. And hey, so I'm doing that, you know? So I, I think they have power in that way for, for personal use. And um, um, yeah, it, it can be. Okay, someone is saying uh, they want a swan. <laughs> yeah, she she's 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 really cool. She plays a lot of musical instruments. She has a little swan, and then she writes books. So swans are kind of cranky. Well, she's kind of cranky too. Sometimes she's you know she writes books, and we know writers can get cranky sometimes. I mean, there's only so many books you can write without really having those moments of. Oh, yeah, complete crankiness, but uh, but I mean, but it's 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 cool. It's a, it's a cool figure. Like I mean, I think the the figures that usually get more um, airtime, if you will, are more uh, docile, submissive female figures. But I'm just saying that I think all kinds of uh, cultures and all communities do have these other fairly radical, fairly subversive moments to their myths, which I feel get, get subsumed, but they're there. And so it's really super interesting. It's, it's, it's super interesting. Um, yeah. So what, what is this comment? Uh, Rashmi, uh, that his story reminded me a little of lyrics to a song by Ritu Purna Ghosh. That song, that's a very good comment. That song is uh, Mathura Nagarpati Kahe Tum Go Kul Jao. That's slightly different. That song is a song which tells the myth in yet a different way. It uh, talks of this love story of uh, Krishna and Radha and that he has now gone to Mathura and when she returns, she is now married. Um, yes, yes, that she's now married. But in the original myth, she was already married when she meets Krishna. So she was married to, to Ayam. Um, and the fact that an entire culture worships her as a goddess, right? I mean, that's, that's again, that's pretty subversive too. The, the, you know, that uh, she was not being held to those notions of like, wife and uh, respectability and all, all of that. So, um, so that was, that's interesting. They're worshiping uh, what was essentially an embodiment of sensuality and passion and love, which is pretty cool, you know? So, yeah. Okay, other people? Anybody else? Someone said, we're shy. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that there's a, a temple in Calcutta in West Bengal, for example, that is a temple for Radha and Krishna, and they're, you know, being worshipped there as, as, as a couple, as a god and goddess <laughs> in this very passionate, erotic embrace. So that, you know, what you mentioned earlier, that there's no line between the sacred and the profane. The, right. the profane is sacred in, right. um, you know, a lot of Indic, uh, you know, mythologies and culture. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. I'll ask it. Um, so for you, uh, what are the repercussions of living a life defined by myth? What happens when a truth is revealed and how do we as writers and people grapple with or mitigate the challenges of telling a new story? Is that for all of us or? For you. Oh, it's for me. Okay. 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 Well, how do, how do we as writers uh, mitigate the challenges of telling a new story? I don't know if we're ever fully able to mitigate it. <laughs> you know, I, I think the writing life is a life that is um, 
full of joys and angst and uh, I mean you all know right I mean you, you you're preparing for that life it's it's seldom as glamorous as it's as it's portrayed right in in um, in magazines and I think those are typically writers with a great deal of inherited wealth you know who get to have these uh, amazing velvet uh, you know uh, velvety lives most of the time it's um, <clears throat> It's solitary, there can be angst. Sometimes you're inhabiting this world that's entirely yours and the angst is that those, those that you love so deeply are not always able to inhabit it with you. They are not a part of your myth, they are not a part of your story as much as you'd like them to and even though they might cry. So I think there's solitude that's built into um, some of this. I mean, I know that for me starting Hummingbird was very much about that, about trying to build literary communities. Um, uh, you know that uh, you know getting out of that solitude because I mean I echo Anne's statement about um, academic pretentiousness though I will probably get killed for saying this but uh, <laughs> but 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 that's true right I mean we have great friends within our departments and so forth but it's still an academic context it's not the same thing and so the the power of creating that those communities where we can invite people to share our story for a little bit I think becomes one way uh, to mitigate it a little bit, if that makes sense. But I don't know this, that there's ever a complete mitigation. I think we always live in the in-between, you know, as writers and every once in a while, I think we've all also had this experience where we're kind of struggling to get to find the right word. And sometimes you struggle with, you know, well, this is not the right word. And I know that as a speaker of multiple languages, sometimes I'm translating from one into the other and it's very hard to find the right word. And it's that moment of feeling in between, right? You've kind of started, but you're not really there. And I feel our real and mythic universes are similar in that way. I mean, you don't fully get there. It's like the notion of home that Sean said, that it's, it's elusive, but that's its power and that's its beauty and that's its magic. It's, it's there and we partake of it in moments, but I don't know that we ever fully, fully get there, you know? Well, yeah. okay. one thing I'll add, add to all this is I, I don't know if there's some new truth out there that ever exists. It's just a new myth that we decide to to follow. And I have a, a favorite band called the Gaslight Anthem, and the singer is a guy named Brian Fallon. Mm -hmm. uh, I started listening to him back probably in 2006, and he was a punk rock singer back then. And uh, I did some research on him recently, and he was like truly punk when he was uh, – you know, this is maybe 2002, 2003, when he was pretty darn young, and it was rough and raw. And um, my daughter and I, we listened to his newest record called Local Honey. And the first song on it is all about him writing a song to his child. And uh, at the very end, the, the child is just drawing something in their brand with their brand new pajamas on. And, uh, the the thing I'm realizing is Brian Fallon, when I was younger, he was younger and he was singing about what I was experiencing. And now we're both older. And now my daughter and I are dancing to him singing about his daughter. And just my new experience matches his experience. And uh, is that a truth in my life? I don't know. It's just the myth that I'm telling myself right now. And in years, my daughter will be somewhere else. She won't be falling asleep right behind me. And yeah. And I'll be listening to some other type of music and Brian Fallon will be singing about some other experience. So I think as we just age, uh, we have new myths that we construct to get us through those times of our lives. Mm -hmm. This is such a wonderful discussion, you guys. And we are at 7.30, so I think we have to sort of kind of say goodbye. If anything, it's left me feeling even more wistful than ever that it's not happened in person. But we will keep that open, uh, you know, in my language. And again, I think Rita would know this, that uh, we don't say uh, amidachi, which would be I'm going. We say amiyashi, which is that I'm coming, I'm returning, I'm coming. you know, uh, as a way of saying goodbye. And I think that's a lovely way to end things without, with, while leaving the doors open for, you know, meeting again and um, recreating a sense of community. So I'm going to say that amiyashi, you know. Um, well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rita and Lizzie, for, for, um, for having this happen. And thank you so much, Sean and Anne, for giving me an opportunity to meet you, even if virtually. And I hope we can meet in person. 
Absolutely. Uh, I hope we can meet in person. The travel restrictions will go away soon enough, yeah. you know. Thank so. you for your for your thoughtful, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, uh, M, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, what am I thinking of? Yeah, that that's such a writerly thing, right? Like when we're like, what what is the right word? We don't want to use anyway. one that's. <laughs> but I love the concept of a hummingbird because hummingbirds are very high strung creatures, and so I can kind of relate. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're tiny, and they can fly backwards. The only bird that flies backwards. So I didn't know that. Yeah, they can. They, it's the only bird that can fly backwards. So it kind of uh, it also has a symbolic link with myth because it's related both to the past and the present. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, as an immigrant, I found that a very powerful metaphor that you don't have to give up one thing. It's just an expansion of home. It's not a switching. It's not a changing. It's not a giving up. It's just an expansion. So my home was one, that. and then it's just like more now. It's not a different one. It's just more, you know? So, yeah. Well, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Thank you, Devo3. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you, Lizzie Fox, for moderating. And for everyone who attended, all of your delightful comments and questions, they're amazing. Um, I think as we are going through this period of COVID-19, um, you know, what Sean mentioned, this idea that we are uh, looking at our language and seeing the value and the words and the names of things and recreating um, myths, creating new myths, right? Um, I think that's really powerful. It's such a beautiful idea kind of to wrap the evening with. And mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to invite everyone on this call to come back here on May 1st at 5.30 p.m. We're going to have Yushin Lai, Trini Dalton, and Carvel Wallace read. It'll be another two-hour reading followed by a discussion. Um, and for all of our authors today, you can go to Bear Pond Books, their website, and order uh, their latest. Please do. Please keep in touch. Um, uh, if you have any questions about our MFA in writing and publishing program, send me or Lizzie an email. We'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, and I just wanted to end this evening by saying something in Bengali, which is, um, as you know, uh, you're saying the both three, you're saying Ashi, which means I'm coming, I, I will return. Yes. And one way to respond to that is to say Dakahabe, which means hmm. I'll see yeah. you again. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you all. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Bye.